car wizard. What's going on? This thing is driving so much better now that we've got it fixed. Good. It's been quite an ordeal to get it that way. It was scary. Let's talk about what went wrong with Mrs. Wizard's car. Let's get started. So yes, we have the car here on the lift. Mrs. Wizard's car broke, and it broke really bad. We're going to talk about what we went through to find out the simple solution that solved the problem, but it took a lot to get there. It was kind of scary, wasn't it, when you were driving it? It was really scary. All of a sudden, I'm driving home from Wichita, and the, the engine just revved up. The RPM went higher, and it, it just it was going really, really slow. It reminded me kind of like driving a Cube. A Cube? Yeah, it kind of had that same kind of power. Same kind of. It went down to Cube power. It went down to Cube power. There was no turbo. It was okay. scary. All right. Well. We went through a lot to figure out what was wrong, and we're gonna go over that. Let's get started. So I do apologize, today it's very cold in Kansas. Cold north wind, we do have the heaters running in the shop. You may actually hear them in the background. That's what the, noise, the fan noise is. But this is Mrs. Wizard's 2015 Land Rover Discovery Sport with the Ford EcoBoost 2.0. You guys have seen it in a few videos. We've done a few things. It actually had a water pump go out at one point, and we actually just got done with the one-year update, and we really hadn't had any issues, and it wasn't even but a week or two after that that this disaster struck. Some of you might have seen this car in the background of one of Hoovy's videos on Hoovy's Garage. It's been in and out of the shop. Sometimes it's just parked here to park here while we're doing something else. But the reason you saw it on Hoovy's Garage is probably because it was currently broke with the issue we're talking about now, and Mrs. Wizard was driving around her SL500, enjoying the drive in her beautiful convertible with the top down. Not today though, Mrs. Wizard, it's too cold. We wouldn't want to do that today. The things that Mrs. Wizard experienced on this when it broke was that there was an extreme loss of power. Every time you give it gas to go up a hill or do any kind of acceleration, it would no longer kind of rev to three or 4,000 RPMs and, and the turbo would kick in and you take off. It was revving to six grand to try to get the power. There was also something else that was going on that we found out later was unrelated. We're gonna go over today how a couple of things can pop up at the same time and throw you down the complete wrong path on getting the car solved. On the right hand side, when we would be driving the car, you could hear like a thunk, 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 thunk. Almost like a a wheel was out of balance or something was flopping around on the tire. It sounded pretty bad. But we're gonna start with what we started with here in the shop to figure out why is it low on power? Why is it revving so high? And what relation is that to the noise we were hearing? Let's get started. So I definitely hooked a scan tool to this to figure out if there's any codes. The check engine light did come on and it had only one code, P0299, turbocharger under boost. And when you see that, along with some of the noise that we were hearing, you automatically start thinking, my turbo's out. You need to verify that that's not the issue, or if there's not boost leak somewhere, and really get down to the bottom of the problem. Let me show you guys what I did to figure out what's wrong. I've got the shield off. That way we can look around and show you around the bottom of the engine compartment. One of the first things I definitely checked was for the charge air cooler pipes, which is one right here. It goes to the intercooler, which is up in there. It looks like a radiator hose, but it is not. It's charge air pipe that actually the boost goes through. It goes up to the throttle body, up through there. We smoke tested the whole system and found nothing. There's also this steel pipe where my finger's at. That comes from the turbo and goes around up to the other side of the charge air cooler. You can see it as it goes up through there to the forward part of the car. And then we'll look from back behind and you can see where the charge air cooler comes out of the turbo. There you can see an orange elbow, kind of a reddish orange elbow that comes directly out of the turbo and goes to that metal pipe that we just saw. 
We checked all those areas for a possible leak for boost. We smoke tested it and found nothing. Everything was completely tight, completely sealed off. The next yeah. thing that can go wrong is the wastegate actuator, which is just a vacuum can, which I'm pointing to right here. You can see the vacuum line that goes to it right here. That can go bad, and we actually hooked a manual vacuum pump up to it, and it worked perfectly. So you think, well, okay, well maybe the wastegate itself is bad. So many of you saw the video of the Audi Q5. It was a black one that we had in the back of the shop. We had to end up replacing the entire turbocharger for the customer because all because the wastegate itself, the linkages and everything failed. It could no longer close the wastegate completely. So I was thinking, oh no, that's probably what's wrong on here. Mrs. Wizard's gonna need a whole new turbo. But I don't wanna buy a whole turbo until I'm absolutely sure that that's what's wrong. So if you look over here, you'll see a small little video clip on the Audi we actually worked on showing how it didn't close properly and there was issues there. And that's kind of what I was thinking on this car. I was thinking we were going to get a new turbo. But I didn't, like I said, I didn't want to spend the money until I took a look. So let's have you guys take a look and I'll show you what we did to find out if that was bad without removing the whole turbo out of the car. The turbocharger doesn't really come off separate from the exhaust manifold. It is all one unit. That means the whole exhaust manifold and everything would have to come off and get this thing out of the vehicle to test it. But I decided that's not the route we're gonna take. You can see where my fingers are. This is the catalytic converter right off the turbo. And it has three bolts bolting it directly to the exhaust side of the turbo. We unbolted that and moved it out of the way with the turbo still intact, still sitting there on the engine. We were able to see the wastegate. So once we got that catalytic converter out of the way, it was basically the same scenario, the same picture that we just saw in the Audi clip. We saw the little wastegate, but there was nothing wrong with it. When we would manually actuate the wastegate actuator with vacuum, it closed completely tight. There was no play in the linkages. There was nothing wrong. So at that point, I knew it's going to hold boost if it's told to hold boost. It doesn't have any leaks through the charge air cooler or any of the pipes or anything like that. So, so the turbo, I checked the vanes, make sure they're spinning free. I made sure there was no excessive play or any scraping on the side of the turbo housing. Everything was nice and healthy. Everything was great. So I was like, why is it not working? The turbo can work. It can do its job. There's no leaks, there's no turbo leaks. Why is there no turbo boost? So now we get to the next step in the equation. Let's lower the car down and take a look. I'll show you. So as you can see, when you have a code like that pop up and you experience what Mrs. Wizard experienced, you can run yourself down a rabbit hole and get yourself into a lot of trouble. Oh my, I need a new turbo. This is broke, that's broke. Unless you go through all the steps that I'm showing you here, to verify, that's the biggest thing in a professional shop, is verify, verify, verify. Is this truly what's wrong? If it's not, we can't just throw the part on there and charge the customer, like a lot of shops unfortunately do. Oh, we threw a $2,000 turbocharger on it, this should fix it. It wouldn't have fixed a darn thing on this car. It would have been back in the same scenario, all over again, and then the customer would have a valid reason to scream and curse. I would say that a, cu a customer in that situation, I would allow them to scream and curse because that's really stupid. You didn't verify. So the next thing I did was hook a scan tool to the vehicle, not just to check the codes, but to start doing manual actuations of the things involved with the turbocharger system. And one of the things I told to operate was the wastegate solenoid or the wastegate valve. When I told it to go to 100%, I should have heard the turbo spool up. I should have seen some action or something going on. I saw nothing. So we checked the wiring going to that, and it was giving the signal. It's pulse width modulated. It's not full 12 volts all the time. It's not an on or an off type thing. Most modern solenoids these days are pulse width modulated. I did verify there's electrical activity going on. So now I know something's going on with this a wastegate solenoid. So now that I tested the whole system, I checked to verify the turbo's fine, 
The wastegate itself is fine. The charge air system is fine. I knew that it was the wastegate solenoid. And I made the same mistake that a lot of you guys make, especially when I get people calling for quotes. Car Wizard, I don't want to buy the OEM part. I found a cheap one from China. So let's try the cheap part first. And that's what I did is I ordered this cheap one off of Amazon, $27. Yeah, you did. And guess what? It failed the next day. It failed the next day. It On didn't my be... way back home from school. And that was pretty scary in itself. You, you were oh, yeah. thinking your car's fixed and then what, what happened? Oh yeah, I, I just got on the highway. It, it, it seemed to be doing just fine. And then all of a sudden I went to accelerate a little bit. Now mind you, think we're in Kansas. There's no big hills here. It had trouble getting up a go again. I was like, oh no. I was thinking this thing was supposed to be fixed. The part was supposed to be good. Did my transmission just go? And then I backed up a little bit, said, no, 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 it's giving power. I'm accelerating just at cube speed again. Back to cube power. Back to cube power, not what I was used to. So drove it straight from school to the shop and it was back here again. And I was back yep. in my Mercedes. So this is a really good lesson for you guys, is that the cheapest part you can find is not always the correct solution. This is also another scenario where a customer could call a shop and be cursing and be mad. And I would validate that claim. I would validate that a customer would be upset. Wait, wait, you mean I could have cursed at you and yelled at you when you bought the chicken? No, car? you're not a customer. You're, you're a spouse. Uh, that doesn't count? No. Oh, man. So this is another scenario where a customer really pushes and pushes, say, car wizard, I want the cheaper, cheap part on my car. I don't want to buy the OEM part. And I say, okay, okay, we'll, we'll give it a shot. We put the cheap part on, it lasts one day in this case, or maybe even a week. And then I get a call of an upset customer. That is a scenario I don't validate the customer being upset because they chose to have the cheapo part put on. And now they're reaping those rewards, which is failure all over again. In this scenario, I finally went and got the OEM Ford part, which is used on the 6.7 Power Stroke, the EcoBoost 3.5, EcoBoost 2.0. This, this is used on all kinds of different Ford products. But I bought OEM Ford Motorcraft. And it cost me 75 bucks, which is what I should have done in the first place, because it's really not that much money. But I was being a cheap shop owner. I don't like to spend money. And Mrs. Wizard ended up reaping the rewards of that, which is failure all over again. Let's take a look where this little thing is at. So you can see it right there. I'll touch it with my flashlight. There's some vacuum lines and some different hoses that go to it. And its job is just to sit there and operate the turbo wastegate. That's all it does. The computer controls it. It's very easy to get to. And totally fix the problem. So the purpose of this video is to tell you guys, sometimes a small problem happens and I've heard it over and over. I get phone calls from customers. I replaced the turbo. I replaced the charge air cooler. I replaced the pipes and it's still acting up. There has to be, I mean has to be, proper diagnosis in a shop today. You can lose a lot of money by just what's called shotgunning the part. I think it's this, so I'll just do it. No, that didn't fix it. Well, how about it's this part? Nope, that didn't fix it either. That's not the way that a shop should fix your car. Be careful you as the owner of your car suggesting what you think is wrong with your car to the shop. Because you might think that the turbo is the problem in this scenario. So you call the shop up and say, hey, I know it's the turbo, just go ahead and replace it. Most shops today will say, absolutely guy, because if it doesn't fix the problem, I'm gonna blame you. You told me to do it. Or another scenario would be where they know what's truly wrong with the car, but they go ahead and replace your turbo anyway just to grab the cash right out of your wallet. You told me to do it. You're going to pay for it. You're not going to complain for the price because that's what you expected. Be very careful about telling the shop what you think is wrong with the car because you could be completely off base. Just in this scenario, a $75 OEM Ford part made this car fully alive again. It's been running great, hasn't it, Ms. Wizard? It has, it has. When this initially happened, me and Mrs. Wizard both thought, we're in this for a new turbo. It's gonna be expensive. This is, this really sucks. But it ended up not being the turbo. 
after doing all the tests, I verified everything, and I was a very happy camper. I could order the cheap Amazon part, which was very stupid. I finally broke down and got the OEM part. It's completely solved. It's been over a week now. It runs perfectly. But we talked about the flapping noise that was up front that can also throw you for a loop. This happens time and time again where something small happens, an error or a failure with a part on a car. And for some reason, some other something will also fail at the same time, and they're completely unrelated. But in your mind, you're thinking, they are related, so it must be this or it must be that. And these issues had nothing to do with one another. Let's lift the car back up and I'll show you what I mean. So while this turbo issue was going on, at the same time, it decided to start making a thunk, 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 thunk noise on the front passenger side of the vehicle. And while we're driving, I'm thinking, is the turbo making that noise? Is it so badly damaged that the turbine wheel is thumping around in there? Or what in the world's going on? And just like I mentioned a minute ago, me and Mrs. Wizard started thinking, uh-oh, it's time for a turbo. These kind of things, like I just mentioned, can completely take you down way the wrong path. So we're driving along and hearing the thunking noise, and now that I've inspected it, I found out it wasn't even anything to do with the turbo. Let me demonstrate. As you're going down the road, around 50 miles an hour, this noise starts coming in, and it gets worse as you get to 60 or 70. All it was was a plastic panel, a cover panel, that wasn't fully attached. And I thought maybe it could have been tire issue, but we just got new tires. I didn't think that would be a problem. But let me show you guys this panel I'm talking about. So as you're going down the road, wind is blowing through here at 70 miles an hour, and it's catching this flap. You can see how flappy this panel is, and it's just... doing that going down the road. That could easily throw you off base. You'd be like, oh my goodness, that turbo's making that noise. Nope, nothing. We're gonna put a zip tie on this and it's gonna take care of that noise. One of the little pieces have broken off of it just from blowing in the wind, but this is very easy for something to get you into big trouble. So now you can see all the ingredients that were included in this issue when everything went wrong that I started thinking, $1,500, $2,000, and I'm thinking, oh no, this is not gonna be good. And all it really took was $75. But we lost $25, $27, trying to do the cheap way. We're gonna return that as a failure. I hope they'll give us our money back. But if not, we lost $27 for being cheap. So I'll go ahead and get this pan back on here in a minute, and Mrs. Wizard can take her car out of here, and it's fully functional again. We'll also take care of the little flapping noise. But just, this video is really stressing to be careful during your diagnosis and make sure you're doing a proper diagnosis for those of you that are working on your own cars. Or if you have your car in the shop, make sure they're doing a proper diagnosis because even a somewhat seasoned mechanic can be thrown down the wrong path. So once we had all the data and everything in front of me, then I could make a decision. I feared that it was something much greater. But with the data, I proved that it was not. And this is a common issue when people call me on the phone. They want me to diagnose their car over the phone. They're like, this is doing this and this is doing that. What's wrong with my car, car wizard? I want you to give me the answer right now. There's no way I can diagnose your car over the phone. Just no more than a doctor could diagnose you with cancer or any other kind of major issue over the phone. They're not going to do that over the phone. They're going to say, we need to see you in the office. That's the very reason in this shop we don't do free estimates. You don't call up and say, what's your estimate on a timing belt? So many times, just like this, what you think is wrong with your vehicle ends up not being wrong with your vehicle. And I just wasted an hour doing an estimate for nothing. Bring the car into the shop or your favorite mechanic shops. Let them figure out what's wrong then get the estimate together. That's how you get a true idea of what kind of money you're going to be out to get the problem fixed. So the only way I'm going to give you the customer a diagnosis is when I have your car in the shop and the data is in front of me. With no data, you get no diagnosis.
That's just the way it works. So thanks for following along and checking out everything, all the hoops we had to jump through just to find out that a $75 part was bad. But I'm glad that I jumped through all the hoops because I'd rather spend the 75 than the 2000 or who knows how much more for a complete new turbo on this car. If you're curious what kind of tools we use to work on these cars, they're all listed in my Amazon affiliates page in the description below. We get a small cut and we really appreciate that. And if you haven't hit the subscribe button, I really recommend you do that now. We got many cool videos to come. Thanks for watching.